Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Atlantic City, Kevin Lee versus Edson Barboza. And Shaq, it's going down this weekend. A good lightweight showcase between Barboza and Lee. And the winner is going to be that much closer to a title shot. Yeah, both guys coming off losses. And Edson's last loss was really bad. And Kevin's loss was bad in my opinion as well. So they're both coming off losses, both hungry. Lightweight division is the most popping division in the UFC. Poye just got a win. So if whoever wins this fight is right in the mix as well. You know my boy Poirier is about to get that title shot, right? Yeah, and rightfully so. He's the most exciting fighter in the division. And he's had over 20 UFC fights. Talk about paying your dues, because that's exactly what Dustin Poirier has done. But now Barboza and Lee, they get the chance to, you know, I want to say right the wrong, but you know they don't get a chance to avenge their losses, but they get a chance to you know, come back with a win, get back you know, in that win column, get back in that top five position, and uh, try to secure that next title shot. Yeah, man, and... Uh... Kevin's so young, he's been in this game for such a long time, even though he's only 25 years old, and Edson's been in the UFC since way back in the day, so both these guys have paid their dues as well, and uh, Kevin, you know, he's fighting for a cause, Robert Follis, his coach passed away, so it's a very important fight for him. Yeah, and for everyone that missed the recap show, you know, shout out to my boy Alex Cowboy Oliveira, keeping the win streak alive, coming through with the Max Bet winner, like we said on the recap show. You know it's a max bet when your worst case scenario still wins the fight. Yeah, and our worst case scenario won. And uh, shout out to my boy Alex for getting another UFC win, and he wins a lot of fights. And another bonus too. Yeah, you, know? you know you don't just go out there and finish a guy like Carlos Condit, and that's exactly what he did. You know, being on off the couch and coming uh, to get a nice 50k bonus on top of your win and show money. You know my boy Alex walked home with 150, <laughs> right? Exactly. So uh, he had a nice night. So before we break down this entire UFC Atlantic City card. Did you watch uh, the Ultimate Fighter undefeated last night? Yeah, man. And, you know, I, I think uh, this is going to be one of the better seasons. But as far as the fight last night, I mean, Shelby, come on. The the disgrace. You let that guy, John Gunther, get in the UFC. Come on. He's a straight jobber. You could have gave, you know, the first alternate. Imagine that first alternate watching that fight thinking, really? This fucking guy over me? You know, John Gunther, he's a nice alpaca share. And, you know, he'll go on to go and do that again, you know. I just don't think... Uh, UFC fighting. You know, fighting on the local scene is one thing. He can fight in the NFC or, you know, wherever he wants, but Shelby, come on. Yeah, look, if he wants to come take an L to our guys, Robert Hale, Chaz Walton, John Cobb, I'm I'm all for it. But, you know, when I was watching, I was like, get this guy off my fucking TV screen, man. Gets finished in 10 seconds, and then he's slurring his words, and it was it was really, really bad, dude. I'm glad they got that out the way in the first episode. And, you know, I feel like as a company, they should be beyond that, man. We've, we're, come on, we're, this is the UFC. But, you know, the whole undefeated gimmick, that kind of eliminates half the pool because you got these guys like Sodiq Youssef, he's 6-1. and one. That 1-L one prevented him from being on the show, but you know he would dominate half the dudes on that show. Yeah, for sure. But that's why we got Dana White Tuesday Night Contender, and that's going to be uh, something to look out for. But, look, we can go on a tangent all day, but let's break this whole car down, man, because first up, in the welterweight division, we got Tony Martin. He's minus 255. The comeback on Keita, Keitaro, Nakamura is plus 215. Now, I'm not surprised Tony Martin's the favorite, but I'm surprised he's a minus 255 favorite in this spot, Shaq, because as you've seen, Keitaro, win or lose, he comes to fight every single time. Yeah, and, you know, it is a little bit surprising um, that he was this wide. I I definitely thought he was going to be the favorite. Um, Keitaro is one of these guys where, you know, you watch him on tape and you think, this guy really ain't that good. He's old. He's slow. Then when you get in there with him, it's a completely different uh, scenario, and he's whooping your ass. And they're talking about a guy that, you know, went life and death with Zaleski Dos Santos, a very close fight, a very close fight with Tom Breeze, who was probably the biggest welterweight at the time on the roster. And, I mean, Keitaro, he's got a nice pressure game, left kick, straight left, all the uh, left side shots. And Tony Martin, a lot of people forget, yeah, He's always been this guy we've labeled. We've always get. We've always made a lot of excuses for him. Is what I'm saying. We've always, you know, said weight cut this, weight cut that. Oh, he fought Rashid. Oh, he fought Benil. Oh, he fought Leo. How many more fucking times are we gonna make excuses for him? The facts is. Oh, he fought fi- Katara. He's a 500 fighter. He's four and four in the UFC. The reason why they put him in there with Rashid and Benny in those two fights is because they felt like he was on that level, and he is on that level. But when he gets in there, he wasn't performing on that level. Now, why? He, I feel like he was cut, probably cut a bit away. But I know guys that are bigger that do cut the weight, and not to mention he was losing the same way. You know, he would. 
come out early for the first, not even the full first round, maybe like two, three minutes, and then the guys would start to, you know, pick away at him, and he broke every single time. Now, the Johnny Case fight, is Johnny Case with the UFC anymore? Nope. Johnny Case is a, uh, he's a good fighter, a good pro fighter, but he's a pro fighter, not a UFC fighter. Alex White, no wrestling. Uh, Fabricio Camoys, who hasn't beaten Fabricio Camoys, and his other one is uh, Felipe Oliveri, who had one UFC fight and popped and, you know, Never heard from, Never him, heard him, again. from him again. So when we really look at it, he really hasn't beaten much. Um, Nakamura now won with economy. He hasn't even won two fights in a row in the UFC. So, you know, he hasn't strong back-to-back win. So this is going to be a, a crossroads fight. I do think Tony Martin was cutting a little bit away, but I think it's more. I think it's more to that. I think his, uh, you know, his personal life, you know, I think, uh, I just think it might be a little more than a weight cut issue. I think it might be a little bit of a heart issue and a, a getting pushed issue. I've seen him body locked more. Uh, more than once by Leo, Benil, OAM, um, and I think Katar, he said he's weighing about 184 pounds, you know, making this cut to 170. I think Katar is a little bigger than him still, even um, even though Tony Martin's going to be a big guy, I think Katar, as, as the fight progresses and this starts getting uh, a little deeper in the rounds and both guys are fatigued and bloody, I think uh, Katar is going to run away with this. I think it might get off to a slow start because Tony is going to be fresh and a little more faster, powerful, but uh, I think Katar is going to Take a uh, take home a, a third round rear naked choke. I think Tony Martin gets off to a good start, but I think uh, at some point that left kick to the body will play a major weapon, and uh, Tony will start wincing and uh, it'll be four and five. You know, Tony's a big guy. I can see why he moved up to one seventy, but you know, I definitely question uh, the mental fortitude of a guy like Tony Martin because you see other guys cutting mad weight at fifty five. They ain't making excuses. They ain't blaming losses on weight Gilbert cuts. Gilbert Burns cut what like thirty pounds the other day. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? And he won. Um, and, you know, the other thing with Tony Martin is, you know, we have said on the past, you really see what type of what type of guy a fighter is after a loss. You know, after a loss, you have the Yoannas of the world who make, you know, every excuse in the book. Or, you know, you have guys like Dustin Poirier and Vic, after they lose, they don't make excuses. They just go back and train and, you know, they come back. And uh, Tony Martin, he always has an excuse you know, he switches camps a lot. You know, after his first loss, he switched camps. Then he lost that. He switched camps. He's a he's a gem hopper. And, you know, the when uh, when champions face defeat, they put their head down and grind. They don't look for uh, elsewhere training. Oh, I have to move here to, you know, so I can win a fight. You know what I'm saying? So uh, Yeah, I mean, the guy was on a three-fight win streak. He loses one fight by split decision. All of a sudden, let's move to Florida. Let's divorce our wife. Let's do all these things. <laughs> it's like, bro, to take it easy, Tony. You just lost one fight, and it was close. Like, you don't got to change your whole life. And you know what's funny about him moving to ATT is that he initially left ATT because he was getting his ass whooped badly in those sparring sessions. Now he feels like uh, he needs to find answers. And Look, he's going to look big at 170. He's a big guy, and I do think that, you know, the weight cut probably took its toll on him, but, you know, I also he think is, that he's been body locked many times, taken down to the ground, and I, and I also think that uh, Keitaro has a very nice body lock. keitaro has been in there with way bigger men than Tony Martin. I'm talking about Tom Breeze, who was a six foot three welterweight and now is at middleweight. Keitaro took that man down every single round, and Keitaro took down my boy Zaleski down, and, I mean, look, you want to get in there and start grappling with a guy like Keita Nakamura, don't be surprised when he takes your back. I mean, this guy is a rear naked choke specialist. 15 of his uh, 18 submission wins are via rear naked choke. We know uh, if you attack that neck of Tony, Tony will be tapping that mat. So, you know, when, when you see a plus 215, a plus 220, I don't fault anyone for taking the shot. I think it's dog or pass. I think the line should be a lot closer than it currently is. The only thing I'd be worried about is Tony Martin having a second win at 170 pounds because we've noticed a trend with a lot of these guys moving up in weight class and they perform better. But at the same time, those guys that are performing better, they were already performing good in their initial weight classes. I mean, Dustin Poirier was already a top five 145 pounder. Robert Whitaker, you know, he'd only lost a, you know, we, we, between you and me, he really only lost a Wonder Boy. We know he beat a Court McGee in that fight. So, uh, Kelvin Gastelum was performing good at 172. So these guys that are moving up, they were already pretty damn good. They just, uh, you know, they needed to move up. And with Tony, I'm not convinced that he's going to be more than a 500 fighter at uh, 170 pounds. So He's been in the UFC since UFC 169. I think we've seen the finished product. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you here. And look, Tony's no slouch. He's got grappling chops. He's a well-rounded he's a fighter. He's, he's, a he's good everywhere, man. I mean, he put on a nice little striking display against Johnny Case. Um uh, but my boy Keitaro, you don't sleep on a guy like Keitaro, and we've said it on the show, when, when he's the underdog, uh, you know, you, you probably should take a look. So, 
Yeah, I, I got Keita Nakamura here. Probably be a late submission or by decision. Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got Ricky Simone. He's minus 160 in the comeback on Murab Devilishvili is plus 140. Now, uh... I heard you had a dispute, not just with the legitimacy of Murab Divalishvili, but I heard you don't really think he's 26 years old. I don't think he's 26 years old. I think he's 36 years old. But, <laughs> you know, speaking of Murab, I bet on him in his last fight against Frankie Signs. It didn't go our way. Whether you think he won or he lost, it was a close fight, and it, and it didn't get scored for him if you bet him. So it doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't matter that he got 11 takedowns. Yeah, he got 11 takedowns, but with those 11 takedowns, he really didn't do anything on top. Frankie got back up every single time, and he really didn't do any damage with the takedowns. Frankie didn't have a mark on his face, and Murab was cut up and bloody. And, you know, Frankie Signs is a 37-year-old bantamweight. Um, and Mur I'm not going to uh, – let's be honest here. Frankie was kind of faster than Murab. Uh, I'm not convinced Murab's 27. I think he's very green. Um, you know, I, I do like his spirit. I do like his toughness, toughness and his strength and his wrestling. Um, but in terms of on the feet, out in space, I think he's really slow. I don't think he's got any head movements. He likes to, you know, fall in love with these spinning spinning uh, back fist attempts because, you know, he did get one uh, KO by spinning back fist. And, you know, I guess he's uh, seeming to run away with it. And I think he's uh, going for all these low percentage moves that really aren't effective on the outside. And so I, I think Ricky Simone has the advantage on the feet, even though Ricky's very green as well. He's a young kid. But Ricky's got more experience. He's got more wins than Marab has fights. I think Marab still needs some work, man. I think uh, he needs to clean a lot of things up. Um, say he's 27, but uh, I see him operating more of a guy in his upper 30s. And uh, in, the in the Bantamweight division, uh, I don't think that's going to hang. So I got Ricky here. I think his wrestling defense is good enough to keep this on the feet. And I think he's going to land the more effective shots on the feet. And, uh, you know, Ricky... He's a, he's a solid kid. I definitely see room for improvement as well on the feet, but in terms of comparing him with Marab, I think Marab is very slow, very stiff, and I think he uh, likes to block punches with his face a lot, and uh, I think Ricky's going to win a decision. It's going to be a good fight, man. I expect a better Marab de Valichvili than we saw in his debut. I mean, a lot of people don't know he was actually dealing with the flu. Not that that's any excuse, but... but what does the flu have to do with uh, getting hurt to the body with knees every time? Well, it affects your cardio for sure. So I expect a better version of him in this fight. And with uh, Ricky Simone, I like that finishing combo he landed in his last fight. Left hook to the body, left hook upstairs, put the kid away. We've been waiting for Ricky Simone to make that UFC debut for a while now. He is taking this on short notice. I expect big improvements from both guys in uh, years to come. I'm going to lean slightly towards Ricky Simone here. Just because it seems like he's more of a developed product. You know, if you go back and you listen to our last breakdown of Marab's fight with Frankie Sainz, I said Marab's good, but he's super green, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we know he lied on his views. We know he ain't 26 years old. So he might not actually be making too many improvements. And we know that Sarah Longo camp, yes, they do hold the two biggest upsets in the history of the sport. You know, they, they knocked out GSB and Anderson Silva. But aside from that, you know, they're... Uh, they're complete frauds, so <laughs> I'm going to go with the Hawaiian here, man. I'm going to go with Ricky Simone. And next up in the women's bantamweight division, we got Aspen Ladd. She's minus 145. The comeback on Leslie Smith is plus 125. Which way are you going? Uh, Leslie's been doing her thing her last two fights. You really don't see uh, chicks keeping a pace like that. And, I mean, she's moving forward constantly, throwing punches. I think she's landing like eight strikes a minute, even though she is eating like ten strikes a minute. She constantly moves forward, and she's been breaking chicks. Now, I know her record in the past was always 500, but we know how the female game is. A lot of their records are complete shit. I mean, they get thrown in these situations at a you know very uh, early age in their careers, and I think Leslie Smith has a landslide when it comes to experience in the cage, just what she's dealt with in the cage before. And I think Aspen's still a kid. I think she's, what, 23 years old? I think she's got a bright future. But, uh, you know, some things alarm me in that Landsberg fight, the way she was turning uh, turning away in the clinch uh, when Landsberg would, you know, start to tee off a little bit. But Lena Landsberg has won the first round in, against Pudalova and Aspen. So, you know, maybe Lena Landsberg wins the first round a lot. So, but, she survived the first round for a cyborg. <laughs> you know, so maybe she uh, wins the first uh, first round a lot. So, But uh, Aspen, I love her uh, takedown entries. That takedown she hit on Landsberg was beautiful. And the difference between Aspen and a lot of girls is when Aspen gets on top, she usually uh, finishes girls, even dating back to her Invicta days. When she gets on gets that mount position, uh, girls are pretty much done. But the thing is, those girls were Bobby Cooper, who's a straw weight and who's like three and four or four and four. Uh, Sajara Eubanks, who had three fights at the time, 
some other chicks I don't even know. So I, I don't think she's ready for this personally on an experience level. I think she does have a clear path to victory if she can consistently get takedowns. But what I see happening is um, I think, uh, you know, things will start off a little slow. But I think at some point, Leslie will absolutely spaz out on her with punches and bunches. I'm talking six, seven punch combinations. I don't think Aspen's going to be able to handle it. And I actually think Leslie Smith's going to get a finisher. Yeah, I'm going to go the opposite way, man. I think it opened minus 265 for a reason. I think when you're getting taken down by fighters like Rin Nakai. There's a clear opening here for Aspen Ladd to come out here, take down Leslie Smith, and win the fight. It's just about, is she actually going to do it? You know, because she is young, like you mentioned. She is super green. She's also very arrogant. Go go watch her interviews. And I'm not talking about, you know, funny, arrogant, and this, I'm talking about, like, like damn, who, who does this bitch think she is? You know, so, you know, watch her interviews, and you're like, oh, okay, so it's like that. Look, if the, if the opening's there for the takedown, I expect Aspen Ladd to go ahead and take it because in that second round, I'll tell you what, that was a beautiful entry. That was a beautiful level change against Lena Landsberg, and then she finished the fight, you know, very soon after. So I think if that opening presents itself against Leslie Smith, she will take it. It's just about are you experienced enough to not freak out when Leslie's throwing, you know, 100 punches at the air and, you know, the last two land on your chin and Leslie's been in there with everyone. Leslie's in here to piss the UFC off, you know. We, we know what we know what Sean Shelley wants to do. He wants to get her out the UFC real quick. And we need, you know, for a fact, she takes this L. Even if she, even if she gets a win here, there's no guarantee they're going to re-sign her. Well, you know, this is the last fight on her contract, and she purposely did not re-sign because you know she wants to stand up with, for what she believes in. And you know, the thing that uh, she strikes me, she strikes me as one of these like these chicks that are super. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not motiv motivated, I guess, by this whole thing. Like she's kind of weird and activist. I, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, all that good female empowerment, good shit. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I think uh, she's fighting for a cause here, and uh, she strikes me as the type of chick that's gonna spaz out on uh, like how she did in her last two fights. Yeah, I mean, we know she's coming to fight here. It's just that you know when you're fighting Irena Aldana, who is a striker. And was making her UFC debut. You know, you're able to do what you did. You know, the lines makers thought uh, Irene was a four to one favorite, so uh, they thought Leslie was going to get her ass beat. <laughs> they, they've been wrong on Leslie's fights before, because when you see that ten and seven record, you know it's uh, not the prettiest thing I've ever seen. And neither is her fighting style. And by the way, you know she got finished by Jessica I. She did, and you know, um, you know, true story. Uh, you know, uh, Aspen Ladd pulled out of a fight with Jessica I, so you know, this is, this is true too. So, listen, I think the takedown. Uh, openings are going to be there so i'm gonna go with aspen lad we'll see we'll see what happens you know who, who really gives a shit honestly but uh if the takedown's there you better take it because don't let don't let this girl leslie spam on you on the feet you know what i'm saying Corey anderson he's minus 130 the comeback on patrick cummins is plus 110 now people are super confident in Corey anderson i mean i see max bets on Corey anderson i say i, I see people saying that he's easy money and this and that how can you say someone like Corey anderson is easy money. I mean, the guy's been knocked out a hundred times, and I mean, let's be honest, he, he ain't he ain't shit. Um, you know, th well, what they're thinking is they're thinking that Patrick has no hands or no chin as well, and they're thinking that uh, Corey's safe on the feet here. And if you think Patrick, uh, Patrick, did I say Patrick Williams? I meant Patrick Cummins. If you think uh, Patrick Cummins can't land a punch and rock Corey, I think you're. Uh, deeply mistaken we're talking about a guy that beat Jan Blakovich you know what I'm saying and someone's gonna counter Both me did. with a uh uh well uh Jan can't get up but you know it's true he was fighting a different Jan the thing with uh I see the difference between uh Corey and Pat is uh toughness actually you know I think when Pat gets it Pat you know holds on for dear life like Pat will attempt to like survive and give his everything as where Corey gets it straight out cold and uh, you know that might not be a toughest thing as a chin thing but you know the same guys that knock Corey out you know same guys that knock Pat out right for the most part uh except uh Jean Vellante one, one exactly. of them beat Jean Vellante one of them got knocked <laughs> the fuck out by Jean Vellante you know, don't forget about that not to mention what about the Tom Lawler fight when was he, he was a big fight and he already let's be honest here, he lost that fight ice skates and you know what I'm saying wobbling all over the place you know you know yeah Patrick doesn't have any hands but I actually think Patrick's making improvements these last few fights you know he beat Jean Vellante even though it was ugly he outstruck him he's got volume uh the Patrick he's I think you know on the, the wrestling department, Pat's uh, slightly better on paper. I think it'll nullify, but it's a fight I want to. I want nothing a part of, man. Look at both their chins. Like, to lay that on Corey, hey, if you think he's fully safe on the feet, but 
just trust me. When uh, one overhand right lands and he wobbles, don't be shocked. I don't give a fuck if Pat doesn't have hands or not. He's a big guy and he can land a punch. Anyone can land a punch. So uh, ask Jan Blakovic if Patrick coming to Tart. Yeah, look, I mean, I think both these guys are complete flakes. I think both of them don't have chins. You know, I heard someone trying to defend Corey Anderson's chin. <laughs> I mean, the guy. I mean, look, we bet we bet Shogun at how, however old he was for a reason, you know what I'm saying? Because, look, Corey won the whole round for the first four minutes, and then Shogun would drop him. That's the type of guy you're getting, you know what I'm saying? At any point, this could change. I think that Patrick Cummings actually has better wrestling credentials than uh, Corey yeah, Anderson. D1. D1 versus what, D3? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I guess people that are max betting Corey Anderson, they think the volume style is going to pay off here. You know, because Corey kind of thinks he's Frankie a little bit on the feet. You know, Mark Henry, this and that. But the thing with Pat is, you know, he can land that one punch. And against a guy like Corey who can't take one punch, uh, don't be surprised when Corey goes out stiff. I could see it going either way. But since everyone is super confident in Corey Anderson. You know, when they zig, I'll zag. I'll go the other way, man. I'm going to go with Patrick Cummins here for the upset. Now, this is going to be World War Three. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Luan Chagas. He's minus 115, and CR, the great Baja Drazada, is minus 105. Now, one thing we can agree on, and I mean, you notice my tone just went up as soon as we started talking about this fight, because this is going to be a real fight. This is the fight to watch. These two are going to stand and bang until one man falls or, you know, or they're going to have a three-round war. The question is, I mean, who's going to fall, man? Because uh, you know for a fact these two are going to throw some serious heat at each other. Yeah, man. Um, Chagas, you know, he's also a kid. I think he's like, what, 23, 24. Um, you know, his debut against Serginho. That's a tough fight to be in for a kid that age and in your debut. And I thought he performed well. He arguably tenated him in the first round. But, you know, his youth and inexperience definitely came out in rounds two and three just with his fight IQ. You know, him going for uh, specific subs and losing position. And uh, then he gets his redemption against, you know, bum Eric Silva. By the way, Eric Silva was on steroids for that fight. I uh, watched it recently. And, uh, you know, he dropped him 100 times. But the difference was the fight IQ. And, you know, Chagas... I am gonna. I, th I do think he has a, a slight cardio problem because you know he already has a slow, methodical, bruising Brazilian style. You know he's not very. He's not the fastest welterweight, but you know he's got a uh, good timing. You know when he's in southpaw, he likes to kick. But uh, I do think he's got a cardio issue. You know after the grappling exchanges and they're working back up to their feet, he does slow down. And already with that slow, methodical style, and his hands are a little down. You do that against Cr Bahada Razada late in the rounds, and he will crack you. And, Ciara is uh, very crafty with his uh, his chin touches, even though you know he looks kind of out of shape. He, he's old. I think he's uh, a little more experienced. I think uh, Chagas is a little more fresher in terms of the damage wise, but not maybe not necessarily because Ciara only fights like once a year, so it's a very tough fight. I'm actually gonna go with Ciar here. I think uh, Chagas is gonna get off to a good start, but I think he is gonna slow down in the later rounds. And I think uh, this is a case where they keep giving Chagas. You know, I want I want him to fight the more Jim Wall heads of the world. You know, they keep giving him these Give him crafty draw. these crafty vets that. Uh, you know, that will capitalize when they start sensing them to get tired, you know. So uh, I'm going to go with CR here by uh, third round TKO. I think Chagas is going to get off to a good start, but I think uh, CR will catch him somewhere in that second and third round as Chagas starts to slow down. And uh, if Chagas fights smart, CR is a very easy fighter to game plan for. You can win on, you can win on points against CR all day. It's just that Chagas is a young kid, and he tends to like to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and go to war. So i got to go with CR. Look, the blueprint is out there on how to beat CR. You know, you got to fight him like a pussy. You got to hump him. You got to lay on him. You got to do all these things. And one thing we know about Luan Chagas is Luan Chagas fights like a man. So Luan Chagas isn't going to go out there and try to make the crowd go to sleep. He's going to go out there and actually give CR the kind of fight he wants. But I do think that Luan Chagas is the younger, fresher guy. I love how he switches stances on the feet. He's got to be careful, man, because one of those shots from uh, – CR Bahadurzada behind the ear, you know, and it could be good night Irene, man. So he's got to be on top of shit here. And also, listen, I'll, I'm going to make excuses for the kid. If he gasses out here, you know, I'll be wrong. But, you know, the Eric Silva fight, you dropped the guy a hundred times. You had to take your first UFC L. You know, it was what it was. Uh, you make your UFC debut against Serginho when you're 21, 22 years old. I feel like the kid's been through the ringer. He finally got that first UFC win out the way. Now I feel like he's poised and primed to go on a run here, man. So I'm going to go with uh, Luan Chagas by 29-28 unanimous decision. But I think that this is going to be fight of the night. 
I think he's got to be super careful because, like we mentioned, CR is a very, very crafty vet, not just on the feet, on the mat, too. I mean, you saw that uh, Anaconda attempt he went for in his last fight, man, and also the fight before that, even though everyone taps out Brandon Thatch, he did it, too, man. You know, nice little arm triangle there. So CR is a guy that I have a ton of respect for. I believe he was the second fighter I ever interviewed on Half the Battle. And, you know, he doesn't even have to fight. I mean, the guy's royalty in Afghanistan. The guy's royalty in the Netherlands. He's a he's a, tr he's a true badass. He's a pimp. I'm still going to go with Luan Chagas here uh, by decision. You know, I, I think that if it comes down to a battle of wills, CR can pull it off. But if it comes down to a battle of skill, Luan can pull it off. I'm going to go with Luan by decision. And next up in the flyweight division... We got Magomed Bibulatov. He's minus 370, and the comeback on Olka Sasaki is plus 310. Now, last time uh, my boy uh, Magomed Bibulatov was this high of a favorite, uh, you remember what happened. You think he's going to get back on track here against the very tall flyweight Sasaki? Um, you know, yeah, he did let people down, but I, I'm going to go ahead and say it was first all time. You know, he got caught, and I do think he's a better fighter than Miraga. Um, I think this fight is, you know, very favorable to him. Sasaki's got no takedown defense. Um, only thing I see being a little hairy is, you know, on the outside because Sasaki is such a, he's probably the tallest uh, flyweight we have. And now that Lewis smoke is gone. Yeah, now that smoke is gone. So, you know, on the outside, when you ever fight a, a long, long guy like that, everything's kind of weird on the feet just because he's so long. But the path to win a decision is so clear here. I mean, Sasaki has his hard time getting up. Uh, hard time stuffing. I think Magomed can bail himself out if things got hairy just by shooting. I think he'll be safe on the mat as well. Um, Sasaki, you know, they keep giving him these tough fights that I don't think he's ready for, man. So Formiga and now Bubalatov. And, but when you finish Scoggins, yeah, you, know uh, you get saying? big fights. Exactly. That's how it goes. So, so, you know, I think he's going to lose this one here at 30-27, possibly 30-26. Uh, I think uh, Magomed just wipes him out on the mat, just, you know, staying in his guard, killing, killing that clock and winning the decision on, on the feet. You know, it'll be a little weird, but I do see Magomed uh, landing the more effective shots, landing a spinning body kick, you know, something like that, pushing him uh, pushing him down. He'll have his way with him. I'm with you on this one, man. I think that Magomed Dabulatov is going to go out here and outclass Oka Sasaki. And look, Sasaki's come a long way. I mean, I, I know you remember that time that he lost to uh, Leandro Issa. He's come a long way since those days, my man. And I remember when he fought Roland Delorme. And, you know, I'm calling up my boys. I'm like, bro, you got to look out for this guy, Sasaki. And then I had this big bet against him, you know, on him against Issa. And he got absolutely smoked. He got blown out the water. But uh, somehow they didn't cut him. And uh, you know what? He's had some nice performances, you know, against Wilson Hayes. He lost, but he took his back in that third round. He choked out Scoggins. So I don't think he's going to get cut with an L here. But I do think he's going to take an L here. I think Magomed simply too much for him in every aspect, every facet of the game. So I'm expecting a, a finish or a or a very wide decision for Magomed Bibulatov. So, yeah, I don't think this is the last we've seen of Bibulatov at all. I expect him to come out here and be very dominant. And next up in the welterweight division, we got Ryan LaFleur. He's minus 150. The comeback on Alex Garcia is plus 130. Now, man, Ryan LaFleur lost as a big favorite in his last fight, and Alex Garcia won as a big underdog in his last fight. Now they got Garcia as the underdog again. A lot of action has come in on him. What do you think is going to happen here? Um, yeah, it's a good fight, man. Alex Garcia upset uh, Salikov his last fight. And um, Alex, you know, we know the deal with Alex. He's a big puncher. But, you know, the thing is, even with his big punching style, he actually likes to weasel uh, a lot of victories out with the, you know, the wrestling and the takedowns. And Alex, uh, basically my thoughts on him is big puncher, suspect cardio, suspect heart. Um, even though we have seen him win some back and forth fights, but we've seen him in the past when he gets tired, we've seen Strickland get rid of him late. We saw Tim Means pick him apart in rounds two and three. And, you know, Alex is that type of guy. If he doesn't get off to a good start, he's not going to come back and win. You know what I'm saying? If you set the tone on him right away, get his, uh, cardio, you know, diminished a little bit, he's going to fade and, and he's going to lose the decision. You know, he's a solid fighter. He'll hang around with anyone. You know what I'm saying? But He'll never touch that top 15. Now, LaFleur, LaFleur, remember when LaFleur let a lot of people down against Damian Maya back in the day? He was the number one prospect. He was supposed to smash Damian, and he uh, got 50 45 and embarrassed. And, you know, ever since then, he's kind of been inactive. He only fights once a year. Mike Pierce fight now. A lot of people say, oh, he beat Mike Pierce. Tell me one person uh, who's had an easy Mike Pierce fight. <laughs> Ain't nobody had an easy. Not Johnny, not Ricky story. <laughs> nobody had an easy Mike Pierce fight. So, And uh, Mike Pierce's UFC record going into that fight was also 10-4. Uh, and four. So, 
And Mike Pierce wins a lot of fights. <laughs> so uh, I think that one was actually very credible. The thing with LaFleur is uh, he kind of does scare me coming out of the exchanges. I do think he's very chinny. We have seen him wobbled. Um, he generally gets away with it for the most part, but he does wobble just because, you know, he is in good shape and uh, he does know how to push through uh, the fatigue as where Alex doesn't. So that's where I give him the edge. I do think Alex could catch him early. I do think uh, LaFleur is starting to get up there in age. Uh, I don't think he's the same guy he once was, but I do think he'll be able to scrape out a split decision here. I think uh, Alex, I think other players going to use a lot of tie-ups here, you know, hump his legs and get Alex huffing and puffing. And then after they break, I think uh, LaFleur can be effective on the feet with a left kick to the body and the straight left if he can avoid getting knocked out. But I th only think Alex can knock him out for the first round. So I'm going to go with LaFleur for uh, a close 29-28 split decision type of fight. You know, this might be a situation where people are overvaluing Garcia just because, you know, they all had max bets on Salikov in the last fight. And, you know, Garcia went out there and choked him out. So now they think Garcia is someone that he's not. But at the same time, man, I feel like uh, a lot of people were wrong about Ryan LaFleur. You know, people were under the impression that he was going to be this top 10 guy. And, you know, because he, he did hand Santiago his first loss. But that was a million years ago. And, he, you know, you know what happened if they fought again, right, Shaq? <laughs> Ryan LaFleur would be twitching on the canvas. So and now he comes back from the Alex Cowboy loss. We know that uh, after Alex Cowboy finishes people, you know, there's certain guys you get in there with and you come back after you face them and you're not the same. Alex Cowboy is one of those guys. After people go through hell with Alex Cowboy, they don't often come back the same, man. I mean, that's just fact. Go look at his uh, resume. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not expecting LaFleur to come out here and be the same. I think that his prime already passed him by. You know, I think that fight with John Howard, the fight with Court McGee, the Mike Pierce fight that you alluded to, that was Ryan LaFleur's prime. But with Alex Garcia, we already know what we're going to get. We're going to get, you know... The, the big puncher who is now a little bit slower. He's got knee problems now. He's always had a... He's always got a knee brace on these days, by the way. <laughs> he's you know, the Powell fight, he looked like complete garbage before he knocked him out. Like, he looked like straight garbage. The Swick fight, he was huffing and puffing. He was able to bail himself out, so... Yeah, uh, Alex Garcia has always had a suspect gas tank. Even pre-Reebok, post-Reebok, it doesn't <laughs> matter. His gas tank's always been fucking terrible, and... He's got knee problems too. I mean, you remember that fight with Neil Magny when he fucking blew his knees out. So, you know, if Ryan LaFleur comes out here and pushes him up against the fence and makes him work, I do see the path to victory for uh, for Ryan LaFleur 100%. He's got to come out here and grind this fight out. It's just uh, how are you going to react to these skull touches? Because, you know, once we examined that film, uh, we, we noticed that it wasn't just because Alex Cowboy hits like a truck. This was something that was uh, brewing for a long, long time. And then it finally came to fruition. And we know against a guy like Alex Garcia, what he's known for is his knockout power. So it's got to be careful. You know, I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to go with Alex Garcia for his second straight upset. Uh, but it has the chance to get very sweaty. So I'd be careful if you were betting this fight. Now, next up in the lightweight division, we got Dan Hooker. He's minus 360 to come back on Jim Miller's plus 300. Now, little secret to all the fans out there. You know, we were actually thinking about betting on uh, – Dan Hooker, but I was thinking, you know, minus 175 to minus 210 range, and I mean, minus 350, unfortunately, got a pass, but uh, what do you think about this fight? Yeah, the Lions makers got this one right. I didn't think they would. Um, you know, Jim Miller, I think he's had enough, man. I think he's a case of, you know, Lowe's, the Lozons, the Condits, the Pearsons. the Pearsons, you know, <laughs> just so many UFC fights. He's pushing 30 UFC fights. I mean, I don't even have to list the amount of wars he's been in. Uh, fun fact, he's never beaten any opponents over that are six feet or taller. Um, I think uh, the long body is going to cause him a lot, a lot of problems here. Dan Hooker's looking the best he ever has at 155. Uh, at 145, he always, you know, showed potential, but, um, you know, just fell up short. And since he moved up weight, man, he's just operating at a different frequency now. One would argue, oh, he beat Ross Pearson. I think Ross Pearson and Jim Miller are operating on the same frequency. Nowadays, everyone in the lightweight division runs through Jim Miller. This is how it works, and I think it's not nothing's going to change here. I think, you know, Jim's going to come out hard in the first round like he always does. And then the second they, you know, have a little grappling exchange and work back up to the feet, he's going to be completely gassed. He's going to go in his corner in between rounds and, you know, squint his eyes and huff and puff and... This will be Hooker's fight. So uh, I got Dan Hooker here getting his third one in a row. I was really impressed with his fight with Casey because Casey's one of these super, you know, physical specimen guys. And, I mean, he slipped and ripped Casey up for two rounds. And that third round when Casey tried to knock him out, he was slipping as well. So I like his uh, slip and rip game. I think he's just more in tune. And uh, I like Hooker here, and I like him by finish. I like Dan Hooker as well, man. Look, 
Jim Miller, much respect. True warrior, true vet, someone that I have so much admiration and respect for. I believe this is his 30th UFC fight. So, I mean, holy shit, not many people can say that they've stepped inside that octagon 30 times. But my boy Jim Miller has. Look, man. You know how the fight game goes. I mean, he's eaten over 850 head strikes. I mean, come of, on, man. Of course he's going to come over. back when he's getting 80 to show, plus if he wins, plus the Reebok, you know? <laughs> hey, look, my boy Jim Miller is going to walk home with a cool six figs for this fight. I'm happy for him. You know, start your brewing company. Start oh, your, he's, he's your hunting good. show. Do the whole bit. Listen, between the second and third round in the – Trinaldo fight he told his corner I don't have it anymore I, I mean so don't take my word for it that's what Jim said so I mean look he doesn't have it anymore and he can't be taller man like you already alluded to I think the first round he's going to come out and probably get a takedown or two you know because Dan Hooker does like to get taken down a lot but like you said he's going to be huffing and puffing between rounds Dan Hooker is going to start establishing that jab don't be surprised if it's a knee up the middle don't be surprised if it's a front kick to the face don't be surprised if it's a guillotine so yeah, I'm going to go with Dan Hooker here, obviously. It's just about, is it going to be a decision? Is it going to be a finish? That's what remains to be seen. But the winner uh, will be Dan Hooker here. And shout out to my boy Jim Miller, because, you know, when you give pints of blood inside that octagon, when you give us all those wars, you know, when you do what that man's done, you know, this is a guy that fought Frankie Edgar on the regional scene. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Jim Miller is a true OG, so, you know. My, Remember when he tapped out Charles? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I tip my cap to a guy like Jim Miller. So, you know, he was once on an eight-fight win streak and didn't get a title shot. Like, the dude's fucking yeah, paid his tough. dues. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now it's Dan Hooker's time. You know, it's funny because we said these dudes, uh, this guy Dan Hooker couldn't get two wins in a row. Now he's about to get three wins in a row, you know? Fight game changes. Oh, yeah, it does. It changes overnight at the drop of a hat. Now, next. speaking of drop of a hat, Middleweight division, we got Tiago Maheta Santos. He's minus 190. The comeback on David Branch is plus 165. Now, man, my boy Tiago Maheta, you know, he comes out in the UFC. He's knocking dudes out left and right with the body kicks. But lately, he's been putting dudes away with his hands, and he's looking in the best form he's ever been in after that Spicely fight. Seems like he got his shit together. Now, he's taking on a guy in Dave Branch who, correct me if I'm wrong, he's won about, what, nine of his last ten fights. So, what do you think here, man? You got Tiago Maheta or you got uh, David Branch? You know, Dave Branch is a solid guy, big gorilla, but uh, so is Tiago Mejeda Santos, and physically speaking, I don't think anyone in the middleweight division is uh, fucking with Tiago Santos. Um, you know, clearly Branch is going to want to get this to the ground because uh, we know that Tiago Santos is a is a, a mat tapper, you know what I'm saying? He will tap that mat, and uh, Branch is, a, is the black belt here, but on the feet, you know, David Branch in his fight against uh, Christoph Jocko, like we said about last week, I was shocked to see Jocko on, on that frequency performing because I thought he was going to light branch up because when you watch him in the World Series of Fighting, he's going 50-50 on the feet with Lewis Taylor. and uh, You can't even finish Chinny You Benny. know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So I don't think he... I think he's got to learn the hard way like a lot of these uh, World Series guys are having to learn. I think he's uh, going to go one and two here. I think the one fight that he did win could have went either way as well. Um, I think uh, Maheda's going to do what he always does, man. You know, of course, if you're betting Maheda, you're a little worried about a long-term battle because, you know... Guys from that camp, they are a little wild when uh, things go, you know, stretch out like Alex Cowboy, Mad. They come from the same camp, so you know if this thing does stretch out, you probably will be, uh, you know, biting your nails. But I do think at some point he will land that left kick to his gut, and Branch will wince. And when he does wince, I think Tiago will tee off on him and get him out of here, just like he's done his last four fights. Yeah, you start to show a little bit of weakness against my boy Tiago Maheta, and he'll uh, he'll get favela on you. He'll and, turn up on you. And Dave Branch likes to live to fight another day, so. If you know what I mean. Dave Branch uh, doesn't have a problem tapping the strikes. Uh, we, we found out that Dave Branch didn't really want that UFC championship belt. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't fighting for the belt, but make no mistake about it. You know Rocco got the title shot with, with uh, that win, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Branch would have got a title shot too. Turns out Branch didn't really want it bad enough. And uh, he, I, don't, I don't give a fuck. You go, you get knocked out on that map. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, watch uh, Lyman Good versus Zaleski. And in between rounds, uh, you know, Tiger Shulman's like, Lyman, what's going on? And he's yeah. like, I, I don't want to get knocked out. <laughs> like, fuck that, he's Lyman. Like, get knocked out. Get knocked out, Lyman. <laughs> fuck that. So, uh, you know what I'm saying? Come on, Branch. Get knocked out, man. It's no big deal. But look, here, here's my here's my issue. This is why I'd be hesitant to go big on my Heta, even though I think it could be a potentially good spot. You remember that Anthony Smith fight where, uh, you know, one second he throws a spinning head kick and rocks him, then he goes for the flying knee. 
to finish him off. Two seconds later, he's in the full mount. Now, that's with Anthony Smith. You know, Anthony Smith, what, uh, purple belt, blue belt, you know what I'm saying? You get full mounted by a Henzo Gracie black belt, and there's chances are you're going to give up your back and get choked out. And we know Maheta, you know what I'm saying? You remember that Spicely fight? Never forget the Spicely fight. So, you know, you give up your back to a guy like Dave Branch, you might be tapping that mat again, but what Maheta needs to do in this fight is he needs to be more disciplined, kind of like he was against Gerald Mershart, you know, because against Anthony Smith, man, he was going wild, man. He, he was feeling his win streak, and he was throwing some flying shit. He was getting loose in there. You got to be a lot more disciplined against Dave Branch, and if he does that, if he stays on his game plan... Don't forget, my boy Anthony Smith was talking mad shit before the fight. <laughs> <laughs> if he stays on his game plan here... Stays focused, doesn't do anything stupid. I think he knocks out Dave Branch. But, you know, if Dave Branch takes his back, that, that could be all she wrote, man. So I'm going to go with my head to uh, via knockout here. We got Aljamain, the Funk Master Sterling. He's minus 115. And the comeback on Brett, the Pikey Johns, is minus 105. Now, uh, is it the Funk Master or is it the Fraud Master? Um, yeah, Aljamain, look. As you guys have heard us on the past before, we did fade him against Brian Caraway back in the day at a uh, plus 350. And, you know, I have not never been high on Aljamain Sterling because, you know, I've always felt like his, you know, look, I'm not worried about anything when it comes to boxing. I, I don't think the kid can box to save his life. I think he's got no hands. I compare him to Elias Theodora, you know. I think he throws, he spams a bunch of kicks and attempts to, you know, keep range and stay away and be athletic. And then, you know, he waits for his opponent's opponents to gas out now even in, in this come up the Takeya Mizugaki fight all you guys go back and watch those fights I mean there was no striking going on they were just you know a bunch of kicks from the outside and desperate single legs and you know when you're fighting a 34 year old jiu-jitsu guy like uh Augusto Mendez and when you're fighting the ghost of Henan Barrao and when you're fighting um Hugo Viana Hugo Viana and Takeya Mizugaki you know what I'm saying? Of course. Uh, uh, uh. And Johnny Eduardo, who has no jiu-jitsu, and Matthew Lopez, who's 2-3 and three in the UFC, finished in the first round. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So when we really think about it, what's he really done? Now, Brett Johns, one would count to me, well, one guy beat Quan Ho Kwok and uh, Albert Morales. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say right here, I think those guys are better strikers than Aljamain, you know? Um, Aljamain, like I said, he likes to spam a bunch of kicks. Now, the thing is, I don't think he can keep up all that kicking for three rounds with a guy like Brett Johns. Brett Johns is going to be moving forward the entire time, and he will... And he will those kicks are, they really aren't that hard in my opinion, you know what I'm saying? I think he's going to walk through the kicks. And I think uh, Brett Johns is coming in here with this fight with the, the best hands we're, we're going to see from him, you know what I'm saying? I think he's got the hand, the confidence to let his hands go more, and I think he already had good hands. You know, of course he had a little spurts here and there of uh, taking too many punches, but like I said, I ain't worried about that with Aljamain because he's got zero hands. And uh, when it comes to the mat, you know, people will think, well, Aljamain's way bigger and he's way taller, but when we... When we look at the facts, Aljamain's 5'7", 71 inch reach. You know what Brett Johns is? 5'7", 71 inch reach. So they got the same height and reach. Yeah, Aljo might have a, a leg reach advantage, but like I said, when we close that di distance, we'll see how much he's kicking. And, uh, you know, I think early, you know, the tie-ups will be a little even, but I think the longer the fight goes, I think Brett Johns has the better cardio. We've seen Aljamain break in the past. When he fought a, a similar style like Brian Caraway in rounds two and three, he got completely broken. He got taken down because when he's fatigued and he's defending takedowns, that's when he starts going for the the the, the fancy chokes, the Takeya chokes. You know what I'm saying? He's still relying on things like that. You know, he'll go for the. Uh, if you think you can get an arm triangle exactly. from guard bottom exactly. in 2018. Well, the You're Bantam mistaken. When Aljamain Sterling was coming up in the Bantamweight division, you know who was in the top ten? All the old guys, the Takeas, the the uh, Eddie Wineland. the Eddie Winelands, the uh, uh, Francisco, Faber. the Francisco Riveras, <laughs> the Uriah Fabers, the Frankie Signs. Uh, that was the top fifteen when he was when he was coming up. You know what I'm saying? The game has evolved. Now we have guys like Cody Stamen, Rob Font, Brett Johns. Um, John Lineker. Alejandro Perez. You know what I'm saying? These guys that have full, well-rounded games that aren't afraid to bite down and fight. And in today's Bantamweight division, you have to be able to bite down and fight if you want to get through. I feel like Al Jermaine has his belief in his head that he can always bail, bail himself out in these grappling situations. And like I said, I'm not impressed with the Henan Barrow, the Henan Barrow win. There's a reason why we uh, faded Henan Barrow against Brian Kelleher, because Henan's completely done. Augusto Mendo's 
Gusto uh, Mendez is a 34-year-old Jitsu guy that likes to play off his back. Of course Aljamain's going to win that. He's going to stay off the sub and he'll stay on top. Brett Johnson. You know he got dropped by Mendez? And he got dropped off a kick. You know, he likes to throw lead kicks, and I think he's going to get countered off on those lead kicks. And not to mention what happened in his last fight. What, how long ago was that? December? He's coming back too soon, in my opinion. And uh, I think he's going to question himself when he gets in there, man. I think Brett's going to stay in his face and force him to make a mistake off one of those kicks and i think uh, brett's gonna floor him with a, a right hand left foot counter or if not don't be surprised when we're dumping out Jermaine consistently in that second and third round yeah look they call him the funk master it's more like the fraud master i mean let's be honest here he got a top 10 spot by beating four washed up brazilians a washed up japanese guy and a school teacher and now we're going to call this guy a top 10 guy you know it's a complete joke and you know we were the original fade Aljamain sterling guys when we cashed that plus 350 uh, on brian caraway and brian took him to school and, you know people are going to bring up oh but he went to a split with a sun style so he must be legit well let's talk about that for a second if you sit back and have a points battle with Rafael sun style He'll play with you. He'll in, he'll engage you in that kind of game. It's just the guys that really fight a Sun Tzu, that's when you see what a Sun Tzu is capable of. When you see a guy like Pedro Munoz go after a Sun Tzu, when you see a guy like Matthew Lopez try to take a Sun Tzu's head off, that's when you see the best of Rafael Sun Tzu. But if you just want to sit back and kick with a Sun Tzu, he'll do that too, and he'll still beat you at that game. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't... You know, I don't view that as, oh, he's yeah. a top three, this and that. No, he ain't shit. Now, uh, now he's fighting a completely different style than a Sun Tzu. He's fighting a guy... He's going to cut off that ring, he's going to crowd him, isn't going to give him the space to get off on his little fucking stupid kicks. And when we talk about these kicks, again, we're not talking about Aldo, we're not talking about Barboza, we're talking about little slap kicks like Elias. It's some, you know, it's some bitch shit, man. And, you know, he was just put on a stretcher uh, less than five months ago, less than six months ago. When we talk about these brutal KOs, you got to take six months to a year off, man. And, and there, there's no way around it. And this wasn't just a oh, flash knockout and he woke up two seconds later. This was one of the scariest knockouts in UFC history where, you know, when they were interviewing Marlon Moraes in the cage, they had to, you know, push him up against the fence so that they wouldn't see uh, Aljamain Sterling, you know, getting put on that stretcher. And Aljo was out for about five to ten minutes after. This was one of the scariest knockouts in UFC history. You know, people thought, you know, it, people thought the worst had happened. Let's just put it like that. Now he's coming back too soon. Don't be surprised when Brett Johns gets his first UFC knockout. And that's all I got to say. Now, people are going to discredit his win over Soto. Did you know that Soto was coming off a win over Haniyaya, where he outgrappled Haniyaya in Brazil? And we're going to talk shit about that win because because Joe Soto gets knocked out a lot. Look, if Brett Johns knocked out Joe Soto, okay, then then maybe we can discredit the win a little bit. But he, he didn't knock him out. He tapped him out, and he tapped him out right away. And this is a guy that just outgrappled Haniyaya in Brazil, like I just previously mentioned so Inverted triangle. if you if you think <laughs> yeah there's a guy that fucking you know what i'm saying a mounted crucifix haniaya in brazil and made him bleed if you think that uh brett john's grappling is in question uh, i think you'll be in for a, a big surprise when he picks up aljamain and dumps him on the ground i, I see this actually uh being a domination man I, I got brett john's here i think he's one of the brightest prospects in the in the bantamweight division and i see him getting a big win here over the fraud master Heavyweight division. We got Justin Willis. He's minus 355, and the comeback on Chase Sherman is plus 295. Now, uh, my boy, the Vanilla Gorilla, you know, he's kind of a walking punching bag. He's got zero head movement, but he's got some very hard kicks. You think Justin Willis is going to come out here and uh, take care of business as the three minus 355 line indicates? Uh, Chase Sherman is what we like to refer to as uh, a jobber, you know? And it's actually uh, so hilarious because, you know what, uh, he was lined at his last fight with Shamil? even which is a uh, in hindsight you know an, an, a stab in the gut look chase sherman he's a nice guy he's funny but he I follows think, me on social I, media i think he should stay i think he should stick with that side you know what i'm saying um look justin willis i think he's gonna win this fight by knockout within the first two rounds um you know would you be worried that maybe he has one of these performances like young fighters tend to have where they don't show up um yeah, but the thing is, I think he'll be fine anyways. I think Chase Sherman, like you said, has no head movement. It's literally tee off city. Um, he's got some nice low kicks, but uh, I just see that straight left finding a home eventually. And, you know, I think uh, it'll be fairly quick. Look, Chase Sherman's two UFC wins are against the two worst guys on the roster. He couldn't even finish Damian Grabowski. You know, Anthony Hamilton finished Grabowski in under 14 seconds. I mean, you can't even finish Grabowski, man. You know what I'm saying? And you think you're going to have a leg kick clinic against a guy like Willis? Look, I'm not saying Willis is a future top 10 guy or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not jumping on board a hype train. But, you know, it's pretty uh, 
it's pretty easy to game plan against a guy like Chase Sherman who doesn't Sleep move his head whatsoever. <laughs> That's been the case his entire UFC career. So, and we know that uh, we know Justin Willis can wrestle a bit too. So, you know, if he wants to take him to the ground, he can take him to the ground. But if he wants to get another highlight reel knockout, I think he can do that as well. Just don't get leg kick, you know, for three straight rounds, and I think he'll be good to go. So I think he's a big favorite for a reason, and I I do have Justin Willis as well. Co-main event of the evening. It's a rematch between Frankie Edgar. He's minus two thirty-five. Come back on Cub Swanson. It's plus one ninety-five. The man, you know, the first time they fought, Frankie beat the shit out of Cub. But similar to Aljamain Sterling, Frankie's coming back too soon from just getting knocked out in the first round. You think that's going to have an effect on this fight? The difference with Frankie and Aljo coming back, uh, you know, in a short amount of time is I think Frankie actually believes in himself, you know what I'm saying, and uh, has faith to, you know, push through tough situations. I feel like it doesn't. Um, Frankie, I feel like it was disrespectful for him to take this fight against Cub. I feel like this just shows what he thinks of Cub. I think that means, like, I'll still be Cub, though, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's funny because Ali Alabdi said uh, they didn't want Frankie to take a fight. They were alarmed when Frankie wanted you know to take this fight. No, he should still be on suspension, right? He's on medical suspension. This happened with Bisping the other day when he came back too soon. He got knocked out. So, you know, betting Frankie is definitely a no-no for me at that line. You know, it's definitely dog or pass. The thing with Cubs Swanson is, when we, Dan, go ahead and reel off his uh, last few wins for me. Hakran Diaz. Bum. Not in the UFC. Bum. Not in the Bum. Uh, fraud. So, you know, um... He really ain't beating shit. He, he's getting up there in age as well. And, you know, I feel like uh, how I see this fight actually playing out is kind of funny. So I see, uh, the you know, the first round maybe being slow, maybe, you know, 50-50 being scored for either guy. But in that second round, I feel like Cub's going to try to take Frankie's head off at some point. And uh, I feel like he's not going to. And then when he doesn't, I feel like Frankie's going to take him down and uh, have his way with him. You know what I'm saying? Just like uh, the first fight went kind of a little bit. But I think uh, Cub, uh, even though he's a top five guy and he's been a top five guy for pretty much his whole career, uh, I feel like if there's any guys in that top five guys that are easily to uh, come out of there, it's him. You know what I'm saying? I think... Uh, He's been tapped out how many times? Uh, and, you know, people say, oh, it's a take it. That ain't the first time he's been tapped out. Jens like, <laughs> Ricardo Lamas, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Max Shannon Hallie. Guberty. So, uh, and it's so funny because I'm so on the fence because, you know, uh, Cub said when he lost to Frankie, he felt like he wanted to get right back in there to, you know, to stay stay in the title picture. And then he took a fight with Max and then he really got derailed. And he says he, feel, he feels like Frankie's doing the same thing because, you know, he, he's still in shock. He can't believe it. And that might be the case here. So this is a fight I don't want any part of. I don't I do not trust Cub Swanson because he finds a way to lose these type of fights consistently throughout his career. Now, I'm not saying that he can't have, you know, a Dustin Poirier moment and finally, you know, get through it. But fucking I just don't think uh, I feel like. He's he's the true definition of a flake, is what I'm saying. So I'm gonna go with Frankie here. Yeah, look, I understand what you're saying, and and I got Frankie uh, nine out of ten times if these two match up. But this could be that tenth time where Frankie actually loses the matchup. I think he's taking the fight for the wrong reasons. His manager told him, "Don't take this fight." He's supposed to be on medical uh, suspension. He's going through some serious shit in his personal life. I mean, dude. He just wanted to come back and fight in New Jersey, you know, for the first time in 10 years. You know he hasn't competed in New Jersey since he beat Spencer Fisher in 2007, right? So, you know, for 11 years, my man. Um, like I said, Frankie's better everywhere. Nine times out of 10, I got Frankie Edgar winning this fight. But this could be that 10th time. Like I said, taking this fight for the wrong reasons. Taking it while you're still on medical suspension. Not listening to your manager. You got all that personal shit going on in your life. I'm going to go with Cub Swanson by knockout. They meet in any other circumstance. Both have full training camps, and I think Frankie dominates him. I think Frankie's the way better fighter, everything. But I think this is that, you know, like I said, nine times out of ten, this could be that tenth time where he's doing it for the wrong reasons. And, you know, if you want to put a circumstance where Frankie loses to Cub, give him all the shit that he's been going through. And this could be that time where he comes out and loses to Cub. So, reluctantly, I'm picking a Cub via knockout. Main event of the evening. We got Kevin the Motown Phenom Lee's minus 155 and the comeback on Edson Jr. Barboza is plus 135. Now, we got one of the strongest grapplers in the division in Kevin Lee versus the hardest kicker in, in Jr. Barboza. I mean, which way are you going, man? Tough fight. Both guys coming off rough losses. Kevin, um, you know, it's definitely, I think he, uh, even though he's 25, 
I think he, in the fight game he's probably 35 or, you know, this is uh, – because he started young. When you start so young, you know, you, you uh, die out younger as well. So uh, he's definitely older in the fight game. Uh, not older than Edson, but uh, he's definitely up there. But uh, Edson, he's taking a lot of damage. Neither guy has a, the greatest chin in the world. Both guys have been wobbled, I mean, several times. <laughs> I mean, I mean, man, Kevin's been wobbled by Efrain. Uh, Leo Santos, Trinaldo, uh, hurt with a body kick by Magomed, uh, Tony Ferguson. I mean, his chin's definitely suspect, and so is Edson's. Jamie Varner, Danny Castillo, Cowboy. Gilbert Melendez dropped them. Cowboy, I mean, man. So, you know, both these guys' chins are soft. Kevin, in terms of tie-ups in wrestling, is probably number one in that division, in my opinion. I mean, when he ties you up, it's scary, man. His tie up serious. And when he gets on top, he smashes guys' heads, and he almost won the title that way. So uh, he's got that advantage. It's clear striker versus grappler. Even though I feel like both uh, Kevin could capitalize on the feet as well, so I do think he's got more options to win. But uh, I think Kevin's going to get off to a good start here. But uh, it's a five-round fight, and I think Edson's got more heart. So I think uh, in the third, fourth, or fifth rounds, those uh, calf kicks are going to start adding up, and I feel like Kevin's going to make a mistake, shoot in sloppy, and uh, possibly get flying knee, but I wouldn't be shocked if it went the other way. I feel like, you know, Edson's getting up there in age and in damage taken, but he seems to have a good spirit still. I feel like Kevin's super emotional, man. Um, and when I say emotional, you know, there's, there's one thing about being emotional outside of the cage. That's one thing, but he's emotional inside of the cage. You know, things do fluster him. You know what I'm saying? Even though he has come back and won, the Tony fight is what I'm referring to. You know what I'm saying? Um, talking in the cage, you know, people talk in the cage, but it flusters him to the point where he makes stupid mistakes and, you know, he ends up getting tapped out or when he, at the end of the first round, he's running in head first, chin in the air and gets dropped to the jab. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I think he is really emotional, so I, I'm, I'm going to go with Edson in here by uh, fourth or fifth round TKO. Um, it's a tough fight to say, but uh, it's a, I, could, I don't uh, disagree with anyone taking either side of this fight. Tough one to call, man. I, I do see Edson having a cardio advantage, but I mean, when Kevin Lee ties you up, man, he's one of the strongest guys in the division, if not the strongest. I mean, he's got a Khabib-level uh, grappling game, man. I mean, you get in there... This guy gets under your legs. You're going for a ride. I mean, even Tony Ferguson got full mounted by Kevin Lee, and I think that Kevin Lee puts Barboza in a situation like that. You could tap him out. Barboza's got to start working those legs early on in this fight, start kicking him, start making him feel it, start going to the body, and you know, start to gradually pick apart Kevin Lee, then start to you know, weigh in on his gas tank because you know Kevin Lee does have a suspect gas tank. He cuts so much goddamn weight, and he said he wasn't going to come back to 55 until June, July, so he might be rushing it a bit. But I do think, you know, from what I've heard, Kevin's in a good spot in this camp. You know, you know, he's dedicating this to his late coach. Shout out to my boy Rob Fallis. It's a tough one to call. It really is, man. Both of them just got their asses whooped in their last fights. You know, did my boy Barboza take enough time off after the Khabib fight? I really don't know because, you know, that was like a 30-23. You know what I'm saying, man? So, you know, I could see it going either way, but I'm going to say Kevin Lee wins via submission. Now we got to hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Kyle, what's going on, man? Hey, not much, man. I'm due for a big win, so I'm thinking it's this weekend. Uh, so let's get to it. Oh, I, I know. I know you're going to come through, as you always do. Because long term, we already know the deal. And look, this main event between Kevin Lee and Barboza. Kevin Lee, a lot of people call him a future world champion. Barboza is the perennial top five guy. It's lined close for a reason. Which way are you leaning? Um, this is a, it's a good one to go both ways on. Uh, I'm leaning towards Barboza. I'd rather save that $600 on DraftKings. Uh, and then hopefully he can uh, get a knee or a, a leg to the head. And it, the fight will be over if that happens, I think. Um, but the same thing goes with Lee, man. If he gets it to the ground, he's likely to submit uh, Barbosa. So both these guys will score high, whoever wins. So it's a, it's a good one to take your shot on both sides. Uh, I'll be stacking in cash. Uh, but if I had to pick one and just one lineup, I would go with Barbosa. Now, Cub Swanson's taking on Frankie Edgar in the rematch. And I said earlier on my breakdown that, look, nine times out of ten, Frankie Edgar wins this fight. But we know he's going through a lot of personal things behind the scenes. He... Uh, he took this fight on very short notice while still on medical suspension after getting knocked out in the first round. You think this is uh, that time where Cub Swanson can actually beat Frankie, or does Frankie just simply have his number? I mean, if there is a time, it's got to be now, right, after being knocked out seven weeks ago. 
Um, so that's what I'm worried about along with everybody else. Uh, so I'm not as confident in Edgar as I would be if that didn't happen seven weeks ago. But in their first fight, he scored 170 points. Uh, he was just able to do anything he wanted. But that was also five rounds. So three rounds, man, it, as long as he doesn't get cracked and knocked out, I don't see how he's going to lose. So Edgar's my pick. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be 100% on Edgar, but I like him, and I don't think I'm going to have much Swanson. I'm just going to hope he doesn't get knocked out because that would be terrible for his career. We know Chase Sherman doesn't move his head. He hasn't since his UFC debut or since his last fight against Shamil. Now he's taking on Justin Willis. My question is, are you willing to pay that heavy price tag for Justin Willis here on your team? Uh, if I can afford him, I like him on the team. Uh, he's going to need the knockout most likely to get – uh, better than a 9,300 uh, 9, salary is going to need. Uh, but I think he can get there because, like you said, Sherman has no head movement. So if he's not going to move his head, he's going to get cracked early and often. So a big boy like Willis can put him down, uh, and I'm guessing that he will. Uh, but at the same time, man, these are heavyweights. So if you want to punt down to Sherman as one of your underdogs, if he's going to win, he's for sure going to pay off his price tag of 6,900. So – if you're looking for a punt and a GPP only, Sherman could be a way to go. I think he'll be low-owned, and they're heavyweights, so anything can happen in those heavyweight fights. But my pick is Willis. Uh, if I have 9300 to spend, I'd put him in my lineup. Tiago, my head to Santos. He looks to continue the momentum here against David Branch. And, man, tiago has been on a roll knocking dudes out left and right. We know Branch is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Which way are you leaning, man? I'm leaning Santos here. Uh, I'm just worried about the takedowns. Uh, he really has nothing off his back, so if Branch can keep getting the fight to the ground, uh, Santos is going to need the round to end, or he's going to need the ref to stand him up, I'm thinking, because Branch can probably keep him there as much as he wants to. Uh, but I'm hoping he, he has some good takedown defense and is able to get a knockout. But Santos is my pick, and if he's going to win, you would think he'd be able to outscore his 8,900 price tag. So uh, I like him in all formats, but I am nervous uh, about those takedowns. Aljamain Sterling's taking on Brett Johns. Uh, right now, it's a pick em. It's the most uh, contentious pick on MMA Twitter. Everyone has a different opinion. Which way you side? Uh, I'm probably going to fade this fight. Uh, seems like everyone is really interested in it. I think Johns will probably be chalkier, um, and that's probably the way I would go. If I was making one lineup and I had to use one of the two, I'd probably go Johns. But it's such a close fight. I can see it being 29, 28, where there's a round that somebody doesn't get very many points. Uh, so, uh, whoever wins, I don't think they're going to get over a hundred points. So I think I'd rather just fade this fight than use both of them in different lineups and throwing one of them away. So this is a fight to fade and I uh, can't wait to watch it though. Has John's been coming through on DK? Cause I know he scores a lot of takedowns and the last one was a first round finish. Yeah. He averages 96. Um, what do you have? 119 in his first fight because he had 11 takedowns. Uh, and then 79 against Morales. And then in his last fight, he only had 91 because it was so fast. But, yeah, those takedowns, man, anyone who can get 11 takedowns in a fight is usually DraftKings gold. I just don't see him getting 11 takedowns on Sterling here, uh, who's also a great grappler. So I do hope this hits the ground. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what they can do down there. Uh, but if I had to pick one, yeah, I'd say Johns. Dan Hooker is taking on Jim Miller. I think most of us are siding with Dan Hooker. You know, Jim Miller, he's had an incredible career. Hats off to him, but you know the fight game's unforgiving. So now the question is, you know, can you afford Dan Hooker? Is he priced too high? What do you think? Uh, I, I, he might be priced too high at 9,200. I don't know if he's getting 92 points in a win here. Uh, I think he'll need a finish to do so. But Jim Miller has been looking pretty bad lately, and he could make it happen. Uh, but this fight is in Atlantic City. Uh, Jim Miller's from New Jersey, so he's got that going for him. <laughs> um, he usually scores well in his losses. If you wanted to use him as a punt in cash, uh, he usually puts up at least 20 to 40, I would say, in his losses. So that's not bad if you're just going to take a, an L there and try and uh, get some points elsewhere. But now the pick here is Hooker. I just don't know how much of him I'll be having. This might be another fight I've had. Now, Magomed Babulatov, he's coming back. He's taking on Oka Sasaki. Now, I know last time Babulatov burnt a lot of people, but you think uh, you're going to give him another chance here? Yeah, I don't know if I like him more than Willis. Uh, if I have 9,400, I would almost rather just make a lineup with Bibula, uh, Bula, Bibulatov, whatever his name is, <laughs> and then do that same lineup again 
with Willis, if that makes sense. Uh, just because I'd rather have exposure to both of them in that same lineup in case one of them sucks and one does well. So I don't really know who I like more there. I'd probably choose Willis, uh, save that 100, maybe pay up somewhere else if you need to. Uh, but I do like him to win. I don't see me having any Sasaki. So, man, my fight to watch is Luan Chagas for CR Bahadur Zada. I think it's going to be an absolute war. Are you leading a certain way, or are you going to stack this fight? What are you thinking? Uh, this is a fight where I am for sure going to go both ways on. Um, I think whoever does win will score highly. I think this is going to be a barn burn, maybe a fight of the night type of fight. Uh, so I would rather just take both sides, uh, and then hopefully my other five work out. And then whoever wins this fight, hopefully that lineup will just win first place, win me 15K. Uh, so that's my plan on this fight. This, is, this and the main event are the best two fights to go both sides on. Uh, so I like both these guys. If I had to pick, I would go Chagas. Now, Kyle, everyone is super confident that Corey Anderson is going to beat Patrick Cummins. And I don't know how you could trust either of these guys with your hard-earned money. I know you like to zig when they zag. So, I mean, what do you think about Corey versus Pat here? Ah, uh, man, this it's such a close one where it might just be a fight to fade because I can't really choose a winner. But like you said, everyone is on Anderson, so if I was going to choose one, I probably would take Cummins, just go the other way. Uh, Anderson has a really bad chin, one of the worst in my mind. Uh, and, I, I mean, Cummins isn't really a knockout guy, but I don't think it needs a knockout power guy to knock out Anderson. So anything could happen in this fight with two wrestlers. I think for the most part it'll be somewhat of a boring stand-up fight, and I think I would rather just leave my uh, put my investment uh, elsewhere, not use these guys. Well, Kyle, we always appreciate your time, my man. The fans can follow you at Big Molly 3 Kyle, any message for them before we talk next week? Now nah, I got head-to-heads posted. Uh, come see me if you want. And once again, uh, that's why Kyle Marley is the DraftKings guy for half the battle, always killing it. Now, Shaq, before we talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch, April's been a big month for us, man. I mean, already 2-0 on events. We got Atlantic City this weekend. We got the Bellator Max Bet next weekend. I mean, this might be uh, the biggest month we've had all year. Yeah, it's been a great month, and it will we'll only continue because, you know, we're consistent workers. We're hard workers. We get the job done consistently. And, uh, you know, we got big things going on this weekend. We still got to uh, tune up some little details here and there with some of these plays. And make no mistake about it, we will uh, get the job done this weekend. And moving forward, uh, all my clients are happy with their uh, service. You're not going to get no minus 300s uh, and, you know, all these weird props that everyone can't play. With my lines, you get lines that you can play. If you're betting big or small, you're going to get lines that you can profit off, actually profit off of. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to get uh, these minus 300s, uh, you know, this fight doesn't go to decision. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get a real play. That's only that. available in one book exactly. with some shitty limit. <laughs> exactly. Like, come on. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get real plays. And, uh, sh you know, straight picks, the best straight picks in the game, and we get the job done. Uh, just follow Best Five Picks Official. Shoot us that email, and uh, we can work with you and get you winning today. Absolutely. And, I mean, this is a 24-hour grind. It doesn't matter if we're under the weather like I am right now. Still putting in those 12-hour days, my man, because this is our life. This is our job. And as you say all the time, we get the job done. So make sure you go to bestfightpicks.com. Use the promo code MATADOR, M-A-T-A-D-O-R, with a lowercase m, to save 15% off any package. And I will see you in the winner's circle. Well, Shaq, now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC Atlantic City? My fight to watch is going to be uh, Cub Swanson versus Frankie Edgar because, you know, if Frankie loses this fight, this will be like, it won't necessarily tarnish his career, but it will be like, man, he, he lost the Cub and it will be a huge blow. It will probably be over, you know. Everything will be over. And if Cub wins, I mean, man, he just took out a legend. He just took out Frankie, the biggest win of his career. He just got a new contract. He's got twin boys on the way. And uh, that'll be a huge win for him. So it's a very important fight for both guys. I mean, it's a crossroads fight for both guys. Both guys' careers are riding on this. Whoever loses this fight is done, in my opinion. So uh, this is the fight uh, to watch for me. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Anytime you get Frankie Edgar and Cub Swanson there, it's absolutely one of the fights to watch. For me, the fight to watch, look. Luan Chagas for Ciara Bahadurzada. You want guaranteed violence, you tune into that fight on the prelims. Those two are going to stand and bang. One man might fall, or it might be a three-round war. So uh, definitely make sure you tune in for Luan Chagas for Ciara Bahadurzada. Now, Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC Atlantic City? 
My fighter to watch is going to be the pikey Brett Johns, man. He, he represents a country. He's got a whole entire country behind him, and I like his style. And uh, if he wins this fight, he's already top 15, but now he's going to uh, p potentially take out a top 15 opponent in Aljamain who's fought some of the best of the best. So uh, if he wins this fight, uh, he's going to be a star, man. He's got a country behind him. He'll be a big star in that, on that Euro scene, and uh, he'll uh, be doing big things. Yeah, Brett Johns is definitely one of the fighters to watch, especially now taking on the fraud master, trying to get that top 10 spot. Definitely a guy you got to look out for. He's just got that winner's vibe behind him. For me, the fighter to watch is Kevin Lee. Look, a lot of people have said this kid's a future world champion. He's coming off his first title setback. He's taking on the perennial top five guy in Barboza. Anytime you can get a win over a guy like Barboza, that elevates your career, your resume to that next step. And it would get him right back in title contention. And we know how dangerous Barboza is. We know how hard he kicks. And Kevin Lee is also going through things in his personal life coming back pretty quick from uh, that title loss. So, you know, I, I think he is the fighter to watch. I want to see what he's got. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this Saturday, UFC AC. Man, I'm excited to get our third winning event of April. You know, we're going to cap it off next week in style with that Bellator Max bed. They can follow you at MMA Genius 05. They can follow me at Best Fight Picks. They can follow our official Instagram at Best Fight Picks Official. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. Hook up those five-star reviews on iTunes. And if you want the picks, go to bestfightpicks.com. Use the promo code MATADOR to save 15% off any package. We will see you in that winner circle. You guys only got uh, one more week with this uh, MATADOR code, so uh, go ahead and uh, abuse it. Yeah, because after this 15% is up, we're going down to 10%. We're just going to let you know right now because, <laughs> uh, you know, people have been loving that Matador code. And rightfully so, you know, rightfully so. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.